Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are in downtown San Francisco at the Twitter headquarters uh, for a big event, the Data Privacy Day. It's been going on for years and years and years. It's our first visit, uh, and we're excited to be here. And, we're, and our next guest is going to talk about something that is near and dear to all of our hearts. Uh, it's Eve Mailer. She's the VP Innovation and Emerging Technology for Forge Rock. Welcome. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So for people that aren't familiar with Forge Rock, give us a little uh, background on the company. Sure, so of course, the digital journey for every customer and consumer and patient and citizen in the world is so important uh, because trust is important. And so what Forge Rock is about is about creating that seamless digital identity journey throughout cloud, mobile, internet of things, devices, across all of their experiences in a trustworthy and secure way. So uh, one of the topics that, that we had down in getting ready for this was, was OAuth. And yes. um, as the proliferation of SaaS applications continues to grow, both within our home life as well mm -hmm. as our work life, we have these, these pesky things called passwords, which no one yes. can remember, and they force you to change all the time. So <laughs> along comes OAuth. Yes, so OAuth is one of those technologies. I'm kind of a standards wonk. I actually had a hand in creating XML for those people who remember XML. That's right. Um, uh, OAuth, uh, took a tack of saying, let's get rid of the what, what's called the password anti-pattern. Let's not give out our passwords to third-party services and applications so that we can um, just give those applications uh, what's called an access token. Instead, it's meant just for that application. And in fact, Twitter, we're here at Twitter headquarters, Twitter uses that uh, OAuth technology. And I'm involved in a standard, being a standards wonk, uh, that builds on top of OAuth uh, called User Managed Access. Uh, and it uses this so that we can share access with applications um, uh, in the same way, and we can share access also with other people using applications. So for example, in the same way, way that we uh, hit a share button in Google, Alice hits a share button to share access with a document with Bob, we want to allow every application in the world to be able to do that, not just Google Docs, Google Sheets, and so on. Right. So OAuth is powerful, and user-managed access is powerful for privacy in the same way. Now there's 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 OAuth, and, and uh, I use my Twitter OAuth all, all the time. That's right. Google. And then, and then there's these other kind of third-party tools, mm -hmm. which add kind of another layer. Um, mm -hmm. So wow. you might use like Tweetbot is something I like to use on my phone to tweet. Right, right. And so well, there's the Tweetbot, but then there's there's these pure like identity uh, password manager applications, which uh -huh. you know you load it into there and then in LastPass or something like that. Right, right, right. One password so, people use. So yeah. To me, it's just like wow, that just seems like it's adding another layer. And if oh my mm -hmm. gosh, if I forget the LastPass password, I'm I'm really in bad shape. Not you just are. for one application, <laughs> but a, but a whole bunch. I mean, how do you see the space kind of evolving to to where we got to now, and how is it going to ch change going forward? It just fascinates me that uh -huh. we still have password words when our phones have um, uh, oh, to, to finger, touch ID finger, fingerprint. Like, I, why can't it just work off not? my finger? More and more uh, SaaS services and applications are actually be, becoming more sensitive to multi-factor authentication, strong authentication, what we at Fordrock would actually call um, contextual authentication, and that's a great way to go. So they're leveraging things like Touch ID, like uh, device fingerprint, for example, recognizing that the device is uh, it kind of represents you and your unique way of using the device. Uh, and in that way, we can start to do things like uh, what's called a passwordless flow, um, where it can most of the time or all of the time actually not even use a password. And so, I don't know, I used to be an industry analyst, and 75% uh, of my conversations with folks like you would be about passwords. And more frequently, I would say now, we're getting into the topic of People are more password savvy, and more more of the time, people are turning on things like multi-factor authentication, right. and more of that. Oh, it knows the context that I'm using my corporate Wi-Fi, which is safer, or I'm using a familiar device, um, and that means I don't have to use the password as often. So that's contextual authentication, meaning uh, I don't have to use that insecure password so often. Right. Um, so I think I think the world world has gotten actually a little bit smarter about authentication, I'm hoping. And actually, technologies like OAuth and the things that are based on OAuth, like right. uh, OpenID Connect, which is an identity technology, a modern identity, federated ident identity technology, and things like user managed access are leveraging the fact that OAuth is getting away from having to use, if it was a password-based authentication, 
not flinging the password around the internet, right, which is right, the problem. <laughs> right. Okay, so that's good. That's getting better. But now we have this mm. new thing, mm -hmm. Internet of Things. Uh, yes, indeed. And people are things. But now we've got <laughs> connected devices. Mm -hmm. you no, know, they're not necessarily ones that I purchased, that I authorized, mm -hmm. that I even maybe am, am aware of. Mm -hmm. Like a beacon on a wall. Like just a beacon on a you. wall yeah. and mm -hmm. sensors. And, and, and the, the proliferation is just now really starting mm -hmm. to run. So yeah. from a privacy point of view, how does, you know, kind of, IoT that I'm not directly involved with compared to IoT with my um, Alexa, uh, mm -hmm. compared to applications that I'm actively participating in, how do those lines start to blur and, and how does the privacy yeah. issues kind of spill over now into managing this this wild world of IoT. Yeah, there's a couple of threads with the Internet of Things. And so I'm here today at this Data Privacy Day event to participate on a panel about the IoT tipping point. Um, and there's a couple of threads that are just really important. One is the security of these devices is uh, in large part a, secure, uh, a device identity theft problem. I mean, with this Dyn attack. In fact, that was an identity theft problem of devices. We had poorly authenticated devices. We had devices that have identities. They have you know, identities, they have identifiers, and they have secrets. And it was a matter of their own passwords being easily taken over. It was account takeovers, essentially, for devices. That was the problem. Um, and that's something we have to be aware of. So, you know, um, just like applications and services can have identities just like people. We've always known that. Right. That's something, you know, our platform can handle. Um, we need to authenticate our devices better, and that's something manufacturers have to take responsibility for. Right. And uh, we can see the government agencies starting to crack down on that, which is a really good thing. Um, the second thing is, um, there's a saying in the healthcare world for people who are working on patient privacy rights, for example. And the saying is, no data about me without me. So there's got to be a kind of a pressure. You know, we see whenever there's a, a front page news article about the latest uh, password breach. We don't actually see so many password breaches anymore as we see this multi-factor authentication come into play. So that's the, you know, the the industry pressures coming into play, um, where passwords become less important because we have multi-factor. Um, we're starting to see consumer pressure say, I want to be a part of this. I want you to tell me what you shared. I want more transparency, and I want more control. And that's got to be part of the equation now when it comes to these devices. It's got to be not just more transparent, but what is it you're sharing about me? Right. Uh, last year, I actually bought Okay, maybe this is TMI. I always have this habit of sh right, right. sharing too much information. That's okay. <laughs> We're on the queue. We like to we like to go hey, where places other being honest here. companies don't go. I, I bought one of those adjustable beds that actually has you know an air pump. Right, right. That uh, what's your number? Your sleep number? It's it is it is a sleep <laughs> number bed and it has a feature that you know connects to an app that tells you how well you slept. Right. You look at the terms and conditions, and it says we own your biometric data. We are free to do whatever we want. Now, where did you even find the terms and conditions? They're right there in the app. You To use the, oh, app, the app, you have the to app say so yes. So you, you actually to... read before just clicking on the box. Hey, I'm a <laughs> privacy pro. I got it. Right, right, right. And, of course, you know, I saw this. And to use the feature, you have to opt in. Right. This is the right. way it is. There's no choice. And they probably got some lawyer. This is the risk management view right. of privacy. It's no longer tenable to have just a risk management view because the most strategic and the most robust way to see your relationship with your customers is you have to you know, realize there's two sides to the bargain because businesses are commoditized now. There's low switching cost to almost anything. I mean, I bought a bed, but I don't have to have that feature. Do, um, do, you, think, do you think they'll break <laughs> it up? So you want the bed. Um, you're using a Fitbit or something else to tell you whether a good, you got a good night's sleep or not. Do, do you see businesses starting to kind of you know, break up yeah. the, the, the units of information that they're taking, and can they deliver an experience based on a fragmented selection? I do believe so. So user-managed access and certain technologies like it, standards like it, there's a standard called consent receipts, they're based on a premise of being able to now deliver convenient control to users. There's even, so there's regulations that are coming, like the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU, it's bearing down on pretty much every multinational, every global enterprise that monitors or sells to an EU citizen. That's, that's 
pretty much every enterprise. Right, right. Um, that demands that individuals get some measure of the ability to withdraw consent in a convenient fashion. So we've got to have consent tech that measures up to the policy that these right. organizations have to have. So this is coming, whether we sort of like it or not. But we should have a robust and strategic way of exposing to these people the kind of control that they want anyway. Right. They all tell us they want it. So in essence, personal data is becoming a joint asset. So we that's so that's in your that so that's in your 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 sleep uh, app. But what about the camera, the traffic cameras, and the 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 public facility? I mean, the, they say in yeah. London, right? You're basically on camera all the time. I don't know if that's fact or not, but but clearly there's a lot that's of true. cameras that, are, that yeah. are that are tracking your movements. You don't get a chance to opt in or out. That is you actually true. That's a tough case. Know. The and then, class of the, right. uh, yeah, the and then class you, and of then the you have security, and right? Then obviously, you know, post 9/11 world. Um, that's that's usually the the justification for you know we want to make sure something bad doesn't happen again. Uh, we want to yeah. keep track. So how does kind of the government's role uh, in that play? Yeah. And even within the government, then you have you know all these different agencies, whether it's the traffic agency or you know even just a traffic camera that maybe KCBS puts up to to keep track of you know it's yeah. a slowdown uh, between two two exits. How does that play into the this conversation? Yeah, where you don't have um, an identified individual, um, and not even an identifiable individual. And these are actually terms if you look at GDPR, which I've read closely. Um, it is a tougher case, although I have worked, one of the members of my user managed access working group is a, one of the sort of experts on UK CCTV stuff. Right. And it is a very big challenge to figure out, and governments do have um, a special duty of care to figure this out. Uh, and so the toughest cases are when you have beacons that just observe passively, especially because the incentives are such that, and I will grant you, the incentives are such that, well, how do they go and identify somebody who's hard to identify and then go inform them and be transparent about what they're doing? Right, right. So um, in those cases, um, e even heuristically identifying somebody is very, very tough. Um, however, there is a case where uh, eye beacons in, say, uh, retail stores do have a very high incentive to identify their consumers and right. their retail customers. And in those cases, the incentives flip, flip in the other direction towards transparency and reaching out to the customer. Yeah, the, the, the tech of these things, uh, of someone who I will, will not name recently got a, uh, <laughs> a drive-through yeah. um, red light ticket. Yep. Uh, and the, the clarity of the images yes. that came in that piece of paper yep. uh, that I saw was unbelievable so yes. I mean if, if you're using any kind of modern equipment yep. the ident the ability to identify is pretty is pretty much there now we have cases and so this just happened actually I'm not gonna say let's see do I say it was to me or to my husband it was in a non-smart car in a non-smart circumstance where it was simply a red light camera that takes a picture of an identified car so you've got a license plate and that binds it to a registered owner of a car. Right. Now, I have a car that's registered in the name of a trust. They didn't get a picture of the driver. They got a picture of the car. So now here we can talk about, let's translate that from a dumb car circumstance, you know, registered to a trust, not to an individual. They sent us what amounted to a parking ticket because they couldn't identify the driver. So now that gives us an opportunity to map that to an IoT circumstance. Because if you've got a smart device, you've got a person, you've got a cloud account, what you need to do is the ability to, in um, responsible, secured fashion, bind a smart device to a person in their cloud account um, and the ability to unbind. So now we're back to having an identity-centric architecture for security and privacy that knows how to, I'll give a, give a concrete example. Let's say you've got, um, a fleet vehicle in a police department. You assign it to whatever cop on the beat. And at the end of their shift, you assign the car to another cop. What happens on one shift and what happens on another shift is a completely different matter. And it's a smart car. Maybe it's a cop who has a uniform with some sort of camera, you know, body cam. That's another smart device. And those body cams also get reassigned. So you want whatever was recorded in the car, on the body cam, with the, the cop, and with their whatever online account it is, you want the data 
to go with the cop only when the cop is using the smart devices that they've been assigned, and you want the data for somebody else to go with the somebody else. So in these cases, the binding of identities and the unbinding of identities is critical, critical to the privacy of that police person right, right. and to the, um, the integrity of the data. So this is why I'm, I think of identity-centric security and privacy as being so important. And um, we actually say at Fordrock, we say identity relationship management as being so key. And whether you use it or not is really kind of after the fact of being able to effectively tie the two together. You have to look at the relationships in order to know whether it's viable to associate the police person's identity with the car identity. Did something happen to the car on the shift? Did something happen through the view of the camera on the shift? Right, right. And all this is underlaid by trust, which has come up in a number of these interviews today. And Indeed. You know, unfortunately, we're in a situation now, if you read all the, all the surveys mm -hmm. in the government particularly, and these are kind of the more crazy cases because businesses can choose to or not to, and they've got a, a relationship with the customer. But on the government side, where there's really no choice, right, they're there. Right now, it, I think we're at a, at a low point on the trust factor. Indeed. So how is that? I mean, and then if you don't trust, then these things are seen as really bad, as opposed to if if you do trust, and then maybe they're just inconvenient or um, they're not quite worked out all the way. So, you know, as as this trust um, uh, changes and fake news and all this other stuff going on right now, you know, how is that impacting the implementation of these technologies? Well, ask me if I said yes to the terms and conditions on, <laughs> on the sleep app, right? <laughs> I mean, I said yes. I said yes. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even ask for the app. You know, my husband signed up for the future. <laughs> <laughs> just showed up on my phone. <laughs> I've said this I was the in stage proximity at RSA, to the so bed, this is right? not news. I'm not right, breaking right. news here. That's right. Um, but, uh, you know, consumers want the features. They want convenience. They want value. So it's unreasonable, I believe, to simply mount an education campaign and thereby change the world. Um, I do think it's good to have general awareness of what to demand, and that's why I say no data about me without me. That's what people should be dem demanding, is to be let into the loop. Um, because that gives them more convenience and value. Right, they right. want share buttons. I mean, we saw that w with the initial introduction of, um, of CareKit with Apple. Because that enabled what, uh, what uh, people who are involved in user-managed access, we call ourselves humanitarians. <laughs> so humanitarians like to say, like to call it Alice to Bob sharing. That's the use case. Okay. And it enabled Alice to Dr. Bob sharing. That was, that's a real use case, right. and IoT kind of made real that use case when in, you know, web and mobile and API, I don't think we thought about it so much as a positive use case, although in healthcare, it's been a very real thing with EHR. You know, you can go into your, you know, EHR system, and you can see it that you can share, you know, with a spouse your allergy record or something. Right, it's right, there. Right. But with IoT, it's a really positive thing, you know. I've talked to you know folks in, in my in my day job about um, sharing access to a connected car to a remote user. You know, we've seen you know the experiments with well, let somebody deliver a package into the trunk of my car, but not get access to you know driving the car. These are real. That's better than you know saving <laughs> a little that one, <laughs> saving a little money by having smart light bulbs is not as good as right, you know right. you've got an Airbnb renter and you want to share limited access to all your stuff while you're away with your renter and then shut down access. After you leave, that's an UMA use case, actually. That's yeah. good stuff. Right. I can make money <laughs> right. off of sharing that way. That's convenience and value. And there's only, I just heard the other day that, that uh, Airbnb is renting a million rooms a night. There you go. So it's so not, once you not have a, insignificant. You have a home full, bristling with smart stuff, you know, that's when it really makes sense to have a share button on all that stuff. It's all not right. just data you're sharing. <laughs> well, Eve, we could go on and on and on. Apparently. Are you going to be at RSA in a couple of weeks? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm actually speaking about consent uh, consent management. All right. Well, maybe we'll see you there. <laughs> that would be great. But I want to thank you for stopping by and, uh, and really enjoy the conversation. Me too. Thanks. All right. Cheese Eve, I'm Jeff. You're watching the cube catch you next time thanks for watching